Good, thank you. Okay. Good. Alessandra and Emily are on and Diana is on. Is anybody expecting someone else who's not logged on yet? No? Okay, Emily and Alessandra, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So am I. Hi. 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 Hey. Well, I think I've met everybody, but I'm Jane, um, and I get to be Associate Director of National Association of Mass Circles now, so it's a pleasure to see you all here today in that capacity. Um, Emily and Alessandra were nice enough to prepare um, our talk today about their experiences working with underserved youth, so I'm going to let them take it away. Um, we'll keep things pretty informal. If you have questions, um, you can feel free to raise your hand or type something in chat, and I think they'll build in uh, time for that as well um, after they have said what they've prepared to say. Is that about fair? To, is that right, Emily and thank Alessandra? You. Okay, yeah, yeah that, go yeah, ahead. That, that works well for us. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you. So um, we, if uh, you're working on a math enrichment program for underserved <laughs> youth, hi, hi, and welcome <laughs> to this webinar. And it's meant to be a conversation. So we'll stop actually a few times throughout the presentation to um, uh, talk to each other and brainstorm together. So we are going to start with some introduction and we'll talk about our common goal and together we will brainstorm about some challenges in doing actually a authentic genuine math experience for underserved youth and we'll share some tips with you. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, my name is Alessandra and I'm the director of the UCI Math CEO program. And I actually started another math circle about five years ago, the UCI math circle, UCI is UC Irvine. And it's still going very well. It's a very nice program. And as you can see from the pictures, the environment is quite friendly. The students are uh, working and uh, they are at the board. They feel comfortable. They present. Uh, and the instructor is against the wall, which is the place it should be. And uh, it's, it looks like a very successful program. The problem is that when you look closely at the students at the board, you can see that they are really predominantly boys and Asian. And uh, so um, this is a big problem to me, especially because just 18 minutes away from, Santana, from Irvine, there is the city of Santana, which is 78% Hispanic. And uh, it's completely different from Irvine because only, not even 12% of the population above 25 has uh, a college degree and the population has a high school degree. And I would like to see these students in the circle. So we started another program, the UCI Math CEO, that specifically targets two schools, two middle schools in Santana. And uh, they are 98% Latinos, and um, only 12 or 20% of the students, depending on the school, is actually doing well in mathematics. So we do math circles at UCI, we bus the students to campus and about 100 students per week. And we work on that um, with interesting math, on interesting math problems together with UCI faculty and students. And of course they struggle a little bit on the math, but it's a very friendly and supportive environment. We always get any chance we can to expose the students to STEM careers. We have an um, annual um, field trip to UCI, one per school, in which they go visit a lot of different STEM labs. And we do a college workshop for parents in, in which uh, students from UCI uh, talk about uh, their experience in college and the pathway that led them to UCI. And uh, the students are really happy about this program. They say things like, it was like going to Disneyland, but I was learning. So it's a very um, rewarding experience for me to lead uh, this math circle, and it's my favorite one of the three that I'm doing by far. 
And uh, now I'm going to actually um, let Emily present her program. Great, okay, so. Let's see if I can do that. Can you see my, uh, can you see the, it's a San Francisco mass circle? Can you see that there or no? Yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, let me go to screen share then. Or, no, this one. So um, our program was founded in 2005 by a um, math professor from USF named Paul Zeitz and um, math outreach and enrichment um, were the dual goals of the program from the very beginning. Um, I have um, some text here that um, you can also find on our website but I will um, I'll, I'll, I'll do some paraphrasing. So um, usually um, students are, or very often students are brought to the mass circle um, by their parents, but Paul was aware at the time that this wasn't feasible for all, for all families. In particular, it wasn't feasible for um, the, the target student population. And so the first idea was um, a model that we used for many years was um, we, we work closely with teachers from the district and we asked them to find students who were interested in doing an hour of math after school and either um, so in that sense the students um, were cherry picked but but to but not not by their parents necessarily and we didn't ask the teachers to bring their best math students we asked the teachers to bring students who they thought would be a good fit for the program who they thought um, showed eagerness and curiosity to play with mathematics and then we provided a small stipend for the teachers to bring these students to the math circle and this could be in their own cars or to to accompany them on public transit and um uh so in that way we wanted to sort of incentivize um, the teachers and also recognize and um, award the additional time that they were putting into their work. And we also had offered a, um, a teacher circle parallel to the student circles that we offered. And we did this model for quite a few years. And then in, I think starting in 2010, maybe, we changed the model to bring the San Francisco math circle to the students. Instead of bringing the students via their teachers to the math circle, we opted to bring the math circle to the students. And that way, things like um, um, public transportation, um, live, um, I, I don't mean liability issues. I mean um, parents not wanting teachers to bring their students off campus, for example. This eliminated a lot of issues for us and allowed us to um, really reach a lot more students. If we knew um, um, a lot of our teachers who we'd previously rec recruited to bring their students worked at um, just a few schools in the district. And so we tried to bring our program to those schools. Um, more recently, we started working with a school called June Jordan's um, School for Equity. And let's see if I can. Ah, pardon me. Here we go. This is a couple pictures of the um, of some of those high school students. Um, this uh, the woman in the yellow um, Columbia jersey is actually one of our instructors. She's a graduate student in math at San Francisco State University, and um, uh, there's the high school students working with her in the upper right. In the lower left-hand corner, the, the young woman in the blue shirt in the front is one of our high school students, and she's actually being a table leader at this um, sort of mini Julia Robinson-esque math festival that, that our program um, put on a few years ago. And so again, we're bringing the math circle to the students. And in particular for this program, um, we really thought about how to cater um, everything from the choice of um, activities to um, the choice of instructors to this particular group of students. Um, Jun Jun School for Equity is predominantly Latino and African-American students. 
most of the students attending our program are um, young Latino students. Um, we do have a few African American students and we've talked a lot about how to increase um, their attendance in our program. And um, the master goal there focuses on social justice, which is um, um, sort of the starting point for all um, for all social and educational interaction with the school. And we also focus on developing mathematical leadership of the students. And um, this program is funded by a Tensor Summa grant. Um, uh, let me exit, let me go ahead and exit the screen share. And Alessandra, maybe you can pick up from there. Okay. Okay. So the goal of this webinar is to um, think about uh, ways to involve uh, more underrepresented students, in particular in California, it means Latinos, in, under, in organized after school activities. And this is, has, uh, is well known to be a problem because uh, students from low socioeconomic status tend not to participate to be tend to be underrepresented in after school programs because families don't have money to spend on the activity they are, the kids are asked to do chores at home and maybe to watch the younger siblings maybe they live in neighbors that are not safe and uh, the parents just work too hard and too long to have time to take the kids to activities like this and so we need to um, come up with alternative ways to increase the Latino population and the underrepresented students into these math circles. And uh, our goal is to try to have a different audience. And by different, I, we mean ethnicity and also socioeconomic status. And actually, in these two pictures, you can see how different are the audiences? Uh, on the left, uh, there is the UCI math circle, and on the right, there is the UCI math CEO. And um, anyway, so changing actually the socioeconomic status, the gender, the ethnicity of the students means um, actually requires a whole paradigm, paradigm change because uh, it's actually the students that we are targeting now are actually quite different. They, are, uh, they have a different level of appreciation for math, a different motivation to learn, different math proficiency, different um, self-efficiency in math, and uh, at least, uh, so this, I, I'm speaking based on my own experience with the students I serve through MathCO, the level of education of the parents is completely different the parental involvement is completely different and they have um, a lot fewer opportunities to participate in any kind of enrichment. And so one thing we would, the first thing we would like uh, to talk about are the unexpected challenges that we all face when we try to uh, do enrich, math enrichment programs for underserved youth. And I would like to hear from you guys what is the, the audience that you're specifically targeting and what are the challenges that uh, you met when you try to open up the doors of the math circles to the students? So if some of you want to start. Uh... Well, I, I can say a little bit of uh, our program. So because when we design this program, this is our first year, right? So when we design this program, uh, it's targeted to actually to the talented students in the middle school. And if we have some younger students in the fifth grade, we also accept them. So we do not, uh, I guess, particularly saying, well, we want to have maybe Latino students or, or Asian students or you know any particular uh, group of students. But it seems, I think one reason is, uh, my department has a long successful record of the outreach programs. And for instance, Dr. Elizabeth Yannick is the one uh, I probably received the national recognition. So for her, I think she and the other faculty members, they have been doing several 
outreach programs for the maybe the Hispanic students or for the female students. So that's why, you know, when I thought about that, I think, it, I guess, it's a personal interest plus, you know, the department already have a, a, a seven other outreach programs. So for my program, I'm directing, I think we do not particularly target, you know, any group of students. But, but on the other side, I do notice for whatever the reason is, we have more uh, female students in, in, in my program uh, than the boys. It's, uh, we not particularly recruited the girls, but it turned, just turned out that way. And the other thing I, I noticed is uh, for, it seems that there's some female students, they need more, uh, you know, someone give them more encouragement to give them the more confidence to do mathematics. It's just my very, like less than a year experience on, on, on the things. So I don't know if any other, uh, you know, colleagues here notice the, the same thing, what is the difference between the, the, the approach among the boys and the girls? What, is there any difference about their attitude on average about mathematics? So that's uh, something I'm just you know, a little curious about. And also, I think going back to uh, this diversity thing, I think it's a, uh, yeah, I think from even we're in Kansas, so it's the Middle West, but, for, but we do have actually in, in, the, in the city here, it's not a large city, but we do have a high population of uh, uh, Hispanics. And uh, so uh, I think it's important to offer the more opportunities for, for, those, for those students. And I heard from the middle school teachers, the, the, the personal difficulty or the challenges certain students they have on their daily basis. That's definitely touched my heart. So yeah, so if possible, we definitely want to promote our programs better Maybe that's them better aware of the existence of this new program and attract more students with the uh, diverse background. I, I think that's something uh, we definitely ha have in mind and would like to keep, keep working on. Yes. So yeah, that's just my quick thoughts on you know what the uh, Emily and uh, Alexander have you know you you have talked about. So those are my quick thoughts on those. Uh, I don't know other colleagues mm -hmm. are talking about. Uh. Um, yes, I can I can talk. Um, so, in my math circle, I think about half of our students are Black or African American. Um, and so one, I think, issue that we've had is like every single one of our instructors is white because we're all coming from Emory and there's not a ton of diversity in terms of graduate students and um, professors at Emory. Um, and one thing that we've done for that is trying to have, like, so this year we had a girls in STEM event where we invited uh, a woman who is African American and grew up in Atlanta, who is like a chemical engineer to lead this. So I kind of, I stepped back and let her take that role. Mm. And then we invited, um, made sure that there, we, in the people we invited to be on the panel that we had um, more uh, another African-American on the panel so that we were still giving role models for our students and thinking about ways that we can invite either partnering with other universities or inviting people in for kind of guest lectures or things like that to have more diversity among the faculty. So I uh, share ours in New York City. We also had to go to the school. Uh, there was no way that, uh, we're working at the elementary school level. There was no way to bring children to NYU, our sponsoring uh, location, uh, after school and to expect them to get there uh, in either a timely way and also the, co the cost uh, would be difficult. So we have a program at a school that we started it last year. Uh, this year I have 14 children attending, half girls and half boys, and uh, a mixture, nearly half of the children are Asian, but that's a mixture, East Asian, I'd say, at the subcontinent, and there's difference amongst all the children and how they perform, but some of them seem very unsure of themselves, 
uh, mathematically. So reminding them that there are no grades, no tests, uh, that this is not about the speed at which one can answer a question, that uh, whatever amount of time it takes is fine uh, as they work and ponder. So that uh, trying to do that has helped some of them to, but they need that reminder again that that's our goal here is to have them play with the math, have fun with it, and get some ideas, but not be the first to yell out an answer, which might be the class style. Um, I would, I'm, I'm very interested today. Um, this is Donna Ferrier from Tulsa. Um, we have a high Hispanic population in Tulsa, and our Tulsa University is, um, we're sort of paired with a neighboring elementary school that has a high Hispanic population um, and uh, African American. So those girls come to our regular, we have a girls math circle. And the girls from our neighboring school come to our regular math circle. And um, I don't know if coming onto campus, it, we're very close to where they live. So I don't know if coming onto campus helps, but the other group that I work with is I've gone to another school, which is almost all Hispanic. And I did seven sessions this year. We were off to a slow start because it took a long time for the teacher to gather up a group for us. Mm -hmm. And when we finally got started, we did seven sessions, um, and the 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 girls just it um, it's very hard for me to get them to talk. And maybe it's um, maybe it's a function of the situation in a, in at Emory. Maybe I am too different from them. But some of them came to our Julia Robinson Festival last weekend, and we have a teacher who's Hispanic, and she spoke Spanish with them, trying to draw them out, et cetera. And I think just the culture of being out in a different culture makes it hard for them to feel comfortable speaking up. But even at their home school, um, one of the things you listed on your, your um, sh PowerPoint earlier was motivation. And so um, uh, the teacher had told me that they were all very interested and very excited about being chosen to come to the math circle. But it seemed like, I mean, outwardly, it seems like they're just not very interested. Um, so maybe that's something people could talk about who have some experience in this. Okay. Hi. Alessandra, did you yes. want to say anything? Um, I, oh, I, I, heard, so I, I thought I heard you. Us, uh, yeah, for us, uh, um, we would have had exactly this same. If, like for the other math circle, um, all, the, all the people that lead the sessions are either faculty or graduate students. And I would have had a very hard time finding role models. But what we did for this other program in which uh, almost all the participants are Latinos, we, we started using volunteers that were undergraduates. And UCI has a huge, uh, starting to have a huge uh, um, first generation student population and a lot of them are Latinos. So by switching the volunteers from graduate to undergraduate, we could actually provide those role models. And we use undergraduates, some of them are math majors, some of them are education major. They are not as strong mathematically as the graduate student would be. So we have to train them on the math. That's the downside, maybe. But uh, um, I think it's still very, very important for the, for the kids to actually be working with um, college students who are also Hispanic. Okay. I I have something to add to that as well. It, it's Donna, is that right? Um, about sort of gauging student interest and also what to do about that. Um, because I think that, um, so at this point, we're a rather large program. We have over 200 students enrolled, um, but this, our high school program's quite small. It's um, 
it's about, we get about six students a week. We probably have um, 12 or 15 students that we see across the semester um, and a consistent um, four or five and maybe we'll get six or eight each week. So um, by far, um, it's the smallest program we have with the best student teacher ratio. And it's also the one that I think about the most and has, um, uh, feel, I feel like the, the highest emotional burden for me. Um, it, not that this is a bad thing, it's just, um, um, uh, it's, I think it's hard to think about, well, what are the metrics for six, what are our metrics for success? You know, if the students seem interested, that's always a good one, right? For my other math circles, um, I always want to feel like, I, I mean, I, my, my goal is to feel like we engage deeply in mathematics and often we do, but sometimes we don't get that deep into the math, but the kids have so much fun doing this slightly mathematical task and they feel like they did math for an hour and it's so much fun and the lasting impression is great joy in mathematics. And so this is a metric we can use is the, the amount of fun the students have, the amount of interest we see. We can also say like the depth of engagement that we observe. But I think in some of some programs, this in particular, this program where um, um, it's um, this, this high school where uh, it's, it's, it's not predominantly African-American and Latino students, it's all African-American and Latino students. Um, um, it's hard to gauge interest sometimes. And, 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 and one of our instructors who's actually been at this um, location for three years and has a very, um, has very close relationships with the students. Um, she and our host teacher there who is, who's been doing um, work for social justice for years and years. He's um, uh, very much a support for, for all of us and a mentor for all of us and someone we go and talk to about how to better um, serve the student population. Um, there, they both say, so this host teacher and the, and the instructor both say, you know, I'll, most of the, there's, there's, there's two students in this program who we are, who are like really aspiring future mathematicians. Like there, there, there are two who we really see as who might go on and if they choose could, could do graduate school in mathematics. We think, um, they're, 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 um, they 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 just um like we see that now um but even then they don't always show great excitement and the the teacher and instructor both are like you know our kids aren't here because of their um great interest in math mathematics like that's that's not the goal of this program and i think hearing that was really hard for me at first because i was like wait isn't that though and 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 i i think i'm still trying to figure that out, but it was like, no, like th they can, it's still worthy and valuable for, for the students to be engaging weekly in mathematics for self-identified mathematicians of, of, of many different backgrounds, whether they be um, Caucasian or people of color or um, all these different self-identified mathematicians coming in and saying, I wanna hang out with you and do math once a week every fall and every spring. That's still a meaningful, valuable thing. Even if none of them ever identifies mathematicians. But I think that slowly we are, or I wanna say that, you know, they're the ones doing the work. They are making the commitment to come back every week. And even though they don't seem that excited about it, and sometimes I'm like, come on, we're having, like you're, you're enjoying yourself, I can see it, but they're like, meh. You know, they're high school students though, so. Um, there's also this part that's like, they come back every week, and I think that that says something. And it, it's sort of like, how do I come to terms with the idea that they might never, identify as mathematicians or may not never might might never find math that fun and interesting i think it's still a measure of success that these students continue to come back and continue to invest or continue to give us a chance to build meaningful relationships with them so i think right now like you know this week's revelation is these relationships the relationships we form with these students are mathematical ones but 
more than that. They're like, they're mentorship relationships that have like a mathematical twist. And it's, it's those relationships that are far more important for all my other programs. If I, if, if I might be far more disappointed or I might feel like I'm doing something wrong, but I don't, I actually am starting to feel like, Oh no, we're not doing anything wrong. We're like, this is just a different relationship we have. And it's not that it can't be more. It's that I think we have to figure out, be really honest about what some of our metrics of success are. Thank you. That was lengthy. May I jump in? It's yeah. So, uh, um, I'm James Taylor um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I run both a teacher circle and a sort of an umbrella organization of um, supporting and promoting math circles and math festivals in northern New Mexico. Um, New Mexico is at the bottom of pretty much every educational measure. The, fan, the Santa Fe schools, the high schools, uh, rate something on the order of 10% proficiency in math. The graduation rate is about 40%. Um, so, there's, I was actually in a meeting on Wednesday with a bunch of people in our public school district uh, that are doing tutoring and involved in programs working with it. So, uh, much of the population that we've that we work with in the schools, the kids, there's this enormous disconnect. Um, we may have a group of kids in a Julie Robinson math festival that are having a fabulous time where they might be involved in a teacher circle, I mean a student circle, or maybe I'm going into a classroom at the invitation of a teacher to, um, to sort of to model math circle type activities. But if the students' skill levels, basic, the mechanics of doing the mathematics that they need in school, that they need for the standardized testing, and so on and so forth, is so low, there's this enormous disconnect between the very rich play that I've watched these kids engage in, in a math festival or in a classroom, and then when it comes down to the kinds of things that they need to demonstrate, to get through their textbooks, uh, to get through the testing, there's this enormous gap that wouldn't be present in a traditional math circle of what I call the usual suspects, the kids that are being pushed into high achievement kinds of things by their parents or just naturally interested that come from strong schools and have strong backgrounds in skills and concepts mathematically. And I'm just sort of wondering, uh, I'd like to hear other thoughts about I'm going to say something about it in a minute. Anybody else wants to say something or should I um, continue and address uh, one of the things that James said? Yes, continue. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two unexpected challenges that in particular I faced through the MATSEO program. And one of them is certainly student recruitment, because we are, we are targeting kids that are not looking for math enrichment and their parents are not, which is, again, a, a very big difference compared to the usual suspects in the other math circles. And so we shouldn't, we cannot just wait for them to spontaneously enroll in a math circle, or we cannot even expect their parents to sign them up. And we should really be recruiting them actively. So things we have been doing for that, uh, I think the, the first and most essential thing for us was finding one teacher that really, really cared and wanted to make a big difference and was well respected by the colleagues and the students and had energy and time to commit to the program. And uh, then with the help of this teacher, we slowly made our way into the school and so right now, what we do right now, we make a, a PowerPoint presentation that they show to students during the um, summer orientation before actually classes start. 
Then we go to back to school night and we meet the parents and we give them flyer and we talk to them. And then we write a letter in Spanish to the parents that the teacher distribute to the kids in class so they know, um, they know about the math circle. Yes, Emily. No, sorry. Before you go on to the next slide, may I add a bullet point to this? Um, um, so I, I think the last bullet point here that um, I, you know, like want to add and, or, or, or mention is um, be present in the school, like have a presence in the school. And I think that that's, you know, that's hidden in a lot of these things about, you know, finding a teacher and working with a teacher, coming to the school for back to school nights, making flyers, posters, things like that. I think having a presence, like a person, like the students who recognize you, the teachers who recognize you, and then the students go, oh, this is a, you know, this is part of our school community. I think that's huge. We've actually worked that into our um, program. Um, right now we pay our instructors um, to do the weekly math circles, but additionally we pay them to spend one to two hours a week at the school working in different math classrooms. And, and working is, is like this very loose term, it, it, meaning um, they don't need to be involved in the curriculum development. They're, it's really more about being a presence, um, having lunch with the kids, providing tutoring if they want. It doesn't have to be that. It's more about um, creating meaningful relationships with the students and really being part of that school community. And I think um, even just things like attending back to school night and like being there shows to the students in these sort of um, subtle ways the commitment you're making to their community. Yes, and I think it's, it's absolutely, I completely agree. It's important to be there to meet the parents in person. And it's important, very important, the attitude you go, you go with in the school. Because uh, like when we go to back to school night or, or like last month we had the parent workshop. And uh, yes, I was giving the whole presentation about uh, pathways to college. But before that, I was serving people to the parents one by one right it's I think it, it, it's very important that we are in the school, inside the school and we are in there with a not with with a really really um, humble attitude too I think that's important too we'll, we'll talk about that second. okay so the other big um, um, issue that we faced was actually student retention and uh, um, some, the problem that we see, at least with the students we serve, which are uh, somehow uh, not um, much more proficient in mathematics than the one that James was talking about, like one of my school, in one of my school, only 12% of the entire school is, uh, is actually doing well on tests. So um, because they lack math proficiency, they, are not, they also lack math independence and confidence and excitement about math. Sometimes it's really hard to get the kids uh, focus in the meetings. They get distracted, they disengage, and then, they, and then we lose them. So things that we, um, we try, I'm going to maybe just talk a little bit and then share it back to you. Uh, things that we try, well, we had to, we restructure the meetings. So we designed the math curriculum in a special way we focus and really strive to get caring math instruction and we try to be inclusive and culturally sensitive and I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these four things so regarding the structure of the meetings we do small group instruction with four or five kids and one volunteer and uh, we run the meetings on campus and we found that it's a humongous difference in terms of motivation to come and attend these meetings because they, it's so much cooler to be on, a UC, uh, on the UCI campus than in their school. And also for us, it's important because we want to do small group instruction and we need a lot of volunteers because we get 100 kids every time. And uh, it's so much easier to get volunteers if, the, if it's right on campus rather than if the volunteers had to travel for half an hour to go there with traffic. And so we actually arrange bus transportation for the students to come and then we bring them back. And in terms of curriculum, we make a lot of effort to, look, to uh, prepare the booklet and we always um, what we hope for is that uh, no kids will ever be intimidated by the math problems. So there are pictures and there are stories. And there is a lot of scaffolding. 
so it's so different from the material we prepare for the other circle. And there are also a lot of manipulatives. And uh, we have uh, in one of the school, like 40% of the students are um, ESL. So we try to make the instructions easy. And, and then uh, one thing that we do, um, when we prepare the problems, we really try to have two goals. We try to alternate between exploring fun math ideas and actually working on the skills that they need in school. Because my kids don't know that when you multiply by 10, you add a zero. And they're in sixth grade or seven or eighth grade, right? And so some of them lack really basic, basic, basic uh, uh, proficiency and they are terrible in mental math. So whenever we can, we try to, to do those things as well. So we do a combination of uh, introducing fun math and, and critical thinking and actually working on basic skills because they, they really need those two. And um, okay, then uh, um, I think Emily wanted to present one example of math task that she uses. Sure. So this is this is one of my favorite activities to um, or games, I guess, to play with um, students in particular, a group that I, I haven't worked with yet. Um, and I, I've played this with elementary, middle school and high school students. It, I, I call it one pile NIM. I've been told that that actually isn't NIM anymore, but um, it, it's a version of NIM, um, at least, or one could say that. So, so the way I describe this is, um, so we have 20 beans in a pile, and on your, it's a two-player game, and you take turns removing beans from the pile. And the rule is that you can remove one bean or two beans on your turn. And the big questions, what we're trying to explore um, and figure out is, is it better to go first or second? And um, it says here at the bottom, can you find a strategy to win? But a quest, an another um, a similar question that we've we've started using more recently is, um, is there an expert move at every instance of the game? So for example, if we start with 20 beans, the first player might remove one bean or they might remove two beans. And um, um, so then there's either 19 beans or 18 beans left. And so, well, now in this new game, is there an expert move for the next player? And so um, this has some nice game theory in it, but it also really demonstrates a lot, uh, or it's a great, um, I, I think it's a great um, what's the right, sort of like medium game tool with which to introduce um, and, and employ and practice, apply problem solving strategies, which for me, um, I think is um, really where math circle and traditional K-12 um, curriculum really align quite well is with the, NT, the NCTM um, standards for mathematical practice. And, and those really for me are problem solving strategies like smarting, starting small, re, um, reusing and recycling information and games like this I think are great, um, great tools or great opportunities for the students to sort of naturally you know, they, they get down to a small number of beans and then they start going, oh, I know what to do. I have an expert move. And so, um, um, yeah, this is, this is one of, for me, one of the activities that I really like um, for those reasons. Thank you. And then I'll, uh, I'll mention what, this one to me is our best uh, um, retention strategy that we have actually, and it's what I want to call caring math instruction, because we really make an effort to build nurturing mentorship relations. And to me, this was very surprising. I was sure that the students, the middle school students would value that. But what surprised me the most is that um, after the end of each quarter, we, uh, we survey the volunteers and actually those were the ones that were actually banging us, uh, put us always at the same table with the same kids. We, and uh, so it is actually extremely important for the mentors too. And uh, so the, I think the strength of the program is really these, uh, these relationships that naturally form between students and volunteers. And uh, so 
I, we really ask our volunteers to be careful about the students' need to monitor their engagement. If one is being disengaged, go talk to that student and try to bring it back in. And also another thing that to me is very difficult with the particular group of kids that we serve is try to be careful because you want to challenge the kids and, and promote critical thinking, but at the same time, you don't want to hurt their confidence because they're already not uh, uh, very confident mathematically. So try to pay attention to this uh, uh, fine line between the two. I think it's important. And uh, okay, and another thing we try to do is uh, uh, being inclusive. In, so we try to recruit mentors that are Latinos and not all of them are, maybe a half, the other may are typically Asian, most of the students at UCI are actually Asian. And um, is uh, bilingual, so when we do the college workshop at the school, we always do it in both languages. And uh, we send home some family projects and they're also translated in Spanish. And um, so these are all um, things that um, I think are helping with, re with retention of, of the students. And uh, other things that uh, um, we notice is that uh, we need to recruit multiple times during the year because we are on a quarter system and we have uh, breaks of about a month between the three quarters because we have, you know, we need to adjust the UCI calendar to the one of the school district, and so we end up having long breaks. And so as far as when the students are coming every week for, 10, for eight or nine weeks in a row, there is no problem, but during the break, when it's three weeks off, we lose them. So there is the need to keep recruiting every time the quarter changes. And then we try small in incentives. They like the snacks. Uh, we give them prizes if they complete the family project. Uh, and then at the end of the year, the kids that are still in the program come for this uh, big uh, field trip that they love because they go visit all the STEM labs on campus and they really like. And um, okay, so I guess I, if uh, I had another section of top 10 tips, but maybe we want to talk about your own strategies for recruiting or retaining students, whatever you want. I'll start if no one else is. Uh, we have a number of our issues are quite different because we're not at a campus. We don't have volunteers from the campus working with us. Also, Emily, I wondered about your funding because we wanted to have a teacher work with me and be trained by me and then take over the program later. But the pay possibility of the, we're in a school after school program, a pre-existing one, the pay is so low because mm -hmm. it usually aims at kids who are in college now, uh, but often it might be community college, the people working in it often have very little education themselves. Um, so the pay scale was too low to attract any teachers to participate in it. I do, fortunately this year, have one of the program people working with me, and she's participated in uh, Phil and Duturi's programs that are held at Courant or elsewhere to train people particularly, and uh, so she is in training to take over eventually. But uh, Take over your math circle at this school? Yes, yeah, to repeat what I do and be able to do it uh, another year. Um, we we'll start a new group at the beginning level. So uh, we don't have some of the resources that it sounds like the uh, university-based people have because we're not really university-based in that way. Mm. We do, I want to say, uh, I've made our last session be invite mm. the parent mm. to that last session and the kids spend the last day preparing work for the parents to work on of the type we've been doing. And because the kids often have such poor skill levels, the one thing they prepare, they finally really understand and are really able to comprehend at a different level while they're preparing it to challenge the parents. So that has worked really nicely. Um, we don't get enough parents coming, but we've gotten 
uh, Berna has come and people from the Department of Youth and Community Development that oversees the after school programs. I didn't mention this is New York City. Uh, this year we're in East Harlem. Um, we don't have a problem signing kids up. The problem is that we want the parents to understand this is not a remedial math program. And that's uh, important that they not expect that of it. Um, so that's difficult. But otherwise we share those, the other difficulties of the students having a lot of math. Insecurity and lack of experience. So I do emphasize in class, maybe the teacher calls on the same people over and over again who always have the right answer. But here, I don't want you to raise your hands when I go around and ask people in turn so that everyone knows I clearly hear from them. Everyone is a part of it. Well, I, I probably can talk a little bit of our program. So in terms of recruiting students, uh, since the most of our activities is in the, in the middle school here, we only have one middle school in town. And uh, so, <laughs> that, so I leave that responsibility largely to the, to the middle school teachers and the administrators. And I think the, the teachers who worked with me, uh, they've been doing a really great job trying to just talk to the students they have in mind and then trying to recruit them to the program. And, but we did notice uh, after the winter break, there is a drop of attendance. So that's probably what uh, uh, Alexander mentioned, is like, you know, if you have a long break, you do need something to bring the students back. So in terms of retention, I think one thing I found also useful is uh, every few weeks, you want to have some bigger, maybe a little bit bigger events to get the students more interested, not just like the working on a project in their uh, after school classroom, but a way trying to bring the speakers to uh, the uh, university campus. So if we have an invited speaker come from a nearby university, so the, the middle school will have the bus, school bus, to take the students to here. And then that gets them a little bit more excited. And I usually order some like uh, uh, snacks or like the juice first for the, for the kids. So, and then they sit down and listen to the presentations. So far, the three invited presentations, all the three speakers are very interactive with the kids. So they ask questions, they have some hands-on activities. So that keeps the students interested to stay in the program. And uh, the other thing is we're trying to make some uh, out out of town like a field trip like actually tomorrow we're going to take the kids to a nearby university it's about a two-hour drive but we decided to cover that cost to take the kids there and in the morning they have some mathematics competition but then at lunch and afternoon there the you know it's the open house day for the university so they offer a lot of other activities and then we'll pick up the ones that we're interested. We're going to look at those, uh, like a chemistry lab or bio biology department. We're going to visit the different uh, programs. So that way, I think by offer something uh, out of your regular schedule from time to time, that help to uh, keep the students interested and stay in the, in the program. Can I jump in here? I'm Berna. Um, just, I'm going to first start talking about what um, has has been working with, so I'm in charge of several, I'm, in, I'm the support person for several different math circles and we have umbrella programs as well. So the work that we do with Francis at elementary school, that's new for us too. Elementary school is something that it's very hard to recruit, we found, because we have very little control over who gets to be in the program because we're working with this intermediary um, city um, organization we end up getting kids who don't, who don't want to be there. And then I, I think some of the problems that we are having there is because we, don't, we couldn't find a teacher that is very dedicated to this. And that's a big problem for us. Uh, but I have two other math circles that um, meet at Courant over the weekends. And now we're, we actually do have a three week uh, break because of the spring recess. And there was some other issue. Um, so what had worked for us last year, which I'm going to do this year as well, is to, um, well, this is assuming that they have access to emails, is to constantly keep communicating with the parents and the students. So what we ended up doing is sending emails on Fridays 
uh, of including a math riddle, a uh, mathematical riddle. So every Friday we say, we don't have a class, but here's the problem you can think about and you can discuss it when you come back after three weeks. And it seems to be working for us. I mean, we've had students come back just to discuss, like, I tried this, but it didn't work. Like, you know, come back to their instructor and talk about it. That's been working for us. That also um, has a way for us to communicate with the parents as well, because sometimes we end up getting parents' emails anyway, because they don't have their own email addresses. It, has been working for us. Um, the other thing that I've done last year, which was nice, and I'm going to repeat it again, is to ask parents. If we have a STEM professional, any kind, uh, having a parent come in um, and do a presentation one session, some, it creates some sort of excitement because it's one of them, you know, like it's a parent of the student that is there with them, coming in and doing something with them. That also has been um, a technique that we've been uh, doing that that worked. And I actually did um, an undergraduate do a career presentation because last um, conference I heard it from Alessandra <laughs> and then um, it worked out really well. Um, we had a two week break and then I kept like emailing the students saying that we're gonna have a, this great student come and present. She has a double major in computer science and she's a full scholarship student at NYU and that's one of the other things. Our students, some of our students are thinking, well, I'm coming to NYU now, but there's no way I'm gonna be able to come after this program. So we invite the financial aid program people come and talk to them about how they can apply for scholarships as well. And that's another thing that they really, um, you know, benefit from, I think. Should I continue or somebody else wants to say something? Maybe Emily could talk about how it, at her circle, sometimes they group lessons together. Emily, do you, could sure, you say I'd something be, about that? I'd be happy to speak to that. So um, one of our instructors has, um, so occasionally um, over the years we've asked um, for the instructors to um, group activities by theme. That's not something that we require, at th that I require of the instructors at this time. However, I do have some instructors who really have latched onto this idea because they really like it. Um, it helps them um, um, be more deliberate about activity, the activities they choose, and then it also allows them and really allows the students to draw connections between them. So one of our instructors has done, um, he's one of the lead instructors for a team. He, they're doing 10 weeks on algorithms and, and all the different ways algorithms can look. Um, and so they're re, they read the team and um, different manifestations each week. Um, this is with the uh, fourth through sixth graders. And our second, third grade teachers um, are doing, they did a three week unit on probability. And then um, they're now doing um, another three or four weeks on um, Northeast lattice paths um, with, with, again, with second, third graders. And um, what we really like about it is that it allows um, not just the instructors to draw connections between the activities, but for the students, it gives them an opportunity to revisit an activity. They already sort of feel comfortable with this mathematical object. They know the rules of how it works. You can only move right and you can only move up, but maybe one way we're one, one day we're counting the total possible ways to go from one node to another, but the next week we might be talking about the relationship between the total number of ways to get to this node and an adjacent one. But it's too much for one hour, but it really allows the students to draw this, the connections. And, and we found a lot of success um, with that. Thank you. Okay, I actually think we're just about out of time. As much as I want to hear Alessandra's top 10 tips, I think we'll have to save that for, for another uh, get together. Or maybe you can send them out to us um, separately. We'll, we'll decide what's best there. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we do have a follow-up that we'll ask um, someone from your group to, to fill out. 
And um, thanks to Alessandra and Emily for um, sharing and thank all of you for, for telling us about your circles. And it's really inspiring to hear um, what everybody is up to and working on. So thanks for a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks everyone for sharing. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.